First Timothy for beginners, this is lesson nine. Title of this lesson, The Minister and His Ministry. First Timothy chapter four, beginning in verse one. So in the first three chapters of 1 Timothy, Paul has provided information and instruction dealing with you know, the structure of leadership and the qualifications of those who are going to be shepherds uh, and who are going to serve the church. He's also provided a summary of the basic doctrines of the Christian faith which the church should defend and promote. Basically, he said, the deity and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the content and the preaching of the gospel message. If there are attacks, they usually come there. You know, uh, heresies always begin with the idea that Jesus isn't really who He said He was, or we're not saved in the way that the gospel says we're saved. And so Paul is saying you need to protect those core ideas. Um, uh, and this is the church's unique mission, especially the mission of the, uh, of the leaders. So in chapter four, Paul is going to explain why it's so important that the church be on guard for its mission, and he'll also remind Timothy concerning the nature of his own ministry as an evangelist. So in chapter four, Paul warns the church that there is going to be apostasy. Not, it's not if there's going to be apostasy, there's going to be apostasy, and they need to prepare and guard for it. The word apostasy, um, means an abandonment of a former loyalty. You were, here's, the, here's the original point, and you were loyal to that point. Apostasy is falling away from the original point, basically what that, what that word uh, means. So he's going to talk about that uh, in these verses. We read uh, chapter four, verses one and two. He says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience, as with a branding iron. So first Paul declares that the apostasy is going to be a sure thing, it's going to happen. And he says this has clearly been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He's not just guessing here, this is a prophecy. So Paul is prophesying about a future event, much like the prophets of uh, the Old Testament prophesied about some of the things that were going to happen with uh, Israel. The later times or the last times uh, is the Christian age. The last time, the Christian age from Pentecost till the return of Jesus. Those are the last times. The falling away or the apostasy will come at different times and ways during the, this period. There's not only going to be one apostasy, one apostasy, there'll be many apostasies, different styles, different people, different eras. So between Pentecost and the return of Christ, many times the church will be faced with uh, heresies. Okay? Uh, he also defines the apostasy. Uh, he says it's falling away from the faith. Now when it's the faith, it refers to the teachings of Jesus rather than you know, I believe or I trust. You have the article there in English, the faith, the doctrine, the body of teaching. Some will leave the teachings of Jesus, he's saying, for other teachings. Some apostasy is when one abandons Christianity for something else. Other type of apostasy is one changes the teachings of Christ and the apostles. In other words, they stay in the church, but they strive to change the teachings of the church. Falling away from the uh, teachings causes one to fall away from the teacher. You know, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Conversely, if you don't abide in my teaching, well, then you're not. So Paul goes on to note what are the causes of this apostasy? What causes the falling away? Well, first of all, deceitful teachers. These are not, you know, when he says spirits, he's talking about teachers. These are not ghosts, they're teachers. They're false teachers in the church and their teachings. In John's gospel, the false teachers denied the incarnation, claiming that Jesus was only a spirit, not really a man. Paul will explain some of the false ideas being promoted by the false teachers that he is dealing with here uh, later on. He refers to them as doctrines of demons. 
Well, if, if the doctrines concerning God are not from God, well then obviously they're going to be from the other guy, right? They're going to be from Satan. Okay, that's, the, that's the point here. Another cause, uh, he says, men with seared consciences. Another way of referring to false teachers, men who have no qualms about promoting what they know is false. I mean, you have hucksters that are trying to sell you, you know, swamp property in Florida or something. You have hucksters that are trying to sell you religious ideas. The bottom line is the same, money, advantage, prestige, whatever it is. Paul is saying here, they know that they're lying, but they don't care because they are motivated not by the truth, but by greed and desire for power and attention. Their consciences are, are, are seared or scarred to no effect. In Acts 20, he talks about them. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among, your own, from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So some are mistaken or deluded and they teach false things because they're mistaken or deluded and others teach false things knowingly in order to promote an agenda for self advantage. The results are the same, however. People are moved to fall away from the truth and the teachings of Christ. We move on to verse three. He says, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. So Paul gives a few details from the teaching of those who were causing the falling away of some during his time. You know, from generation to generation, the type of false doctrine changes, but it always causes the same thing, and that is a falling away. In this case, the teaching promoted a form of ascetic practice to become more, quote, spiritual. No meat, no marriage, and other types of restrictions that would somehow increase one's level of spirituality. Now the doctrine behind these practices was called dualism. It was a form of Gnostic teaching. We've talked about these uh, teachers before. Basically, Gnosticism taught that uh, men had dual natures, two natures, one spirit from God, flesh or matter was from the lower world, spirit was good, flesh was evil, but I mean it was inherently evil, it was all evil. And the goal was to unite the human spirit with God's spirit. And according to Gnostic teaching, there were two ways that this could be done. One, very strict restrictions on the flesh so that the spirit could be released. So food restrictions, restrictions on sex and the idea that you're better off not to marry. You're not allowed to marry. And then the other way was complete indulgence in the flesh since it's not connected to the spirit. So when you die, the spirit will go to God anyways. It's not that the same teachers taught these same, both these doctrines, no, even among the Gnostics, they debated each other. You know, some thought you know, asceticism, that was the way to go. Others thought it didn't matter, you could do whatever you wanted. The spirit and the flesh were not connected anyways. So the debates and teachings argued for one or other of these positions. So it seems that few were persuaded to accept the idea of complete liberation of the flesh since this was so against Christian teaching and morality as well as Jewish teaching and custom. You understand what I'm saying? In the first century, the, the argument against, uh, the argument saying, uh, oh, do whatever you want, you know, your, your flesh is not connected to your spirit, that did not sell very well with first century people who had a Jewish background or people who were Christians. They just, they couldn't buy into that idea but they could buy into the idea of asceticism. Oh yeah, there was a history there of that type of thing. So the idea of punishing the flesh, restricting one's body, this resonated with Christians who were trying to live pure and moral lives. Gnostic teaching was wrong in a lot of ways. For example, both the spirit and the flesh in man were given to man by God and created good. You know, dualism, it sounded close, it was close. Wait a minute, the spirit is good and the flesh is bad. You know, if you didn't think about it long, long and hard, you'd say, yeah, 
That's kind of true. Except when you look in the Bible, you find out, wait a minute, God created the spirit, God created the flesh, and both were good. Another idea, sin is evil. It's sin that's evil, not the flesh. Sin, which is disobedience of God's commands and will, that's what's evil, not your body. Your body's not evil in itself, 1 John 3 and 4. Also, what a person does with his flesh or body affects his spirit. Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin. Well, where do you sin? You sin in your body. The wage of sin is death. So there is definitely a connection between your flesh and your spirit. And restricting ourselves from food or lawful sexual activity does not increase our spirituality. Increasing our love for God by abstaining from sin and loving other people, this is what increases our spirituality, right? What does Jesus say in John 13, 35? This is how all men will know that you're my disciples in the way that you love each other. So Paul emphasizes the fact that it's God himself that provided all kinds of food and the union of marriage in order to be blessings, not causes for sin. Those who know the truth and believe it, they know these things and they're able to eat and marry with a clear and grateful conscience. Verse four and five in this section here, Paul says, for everything created by God is good. Imagine, everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. So Paul goes on to qualify a Christian's attitude and approach to not only food and marriage, but all things created by God. If God created it, it's essentially good. We know that some use good things for evil purposes, but this is man's fault, not God's fault. For example, God created sex for marriage for the joy of the couple, for producing children, for comfort, and so on and so forth, not for pornography. Man's the one that came up with pornography, not God. God created plants for medicine, not drug abuse. You know, well, we know that, don't we? So we can be assured and accept what God has given in good conscience for three reasons. Number one, he tells us that what he wants in return for his blessing is gratitude, not denial of the blessings. He is more pleased if we say thank you for the food that we eat than if we deny ourselves the food that he gave us. <laughs> and it's not, listen, he wants, you know why he wants the gratitude? It's not like, you know, I, I got to have gratitude. Like, it's not as if God needs affirmation. <laughs> he doesn't need affirmation. He wants gratitude because he knows that us giving gratitude to him becomes a great blessing for us. We're the ones that receive additional blessings if we have a grateful heart. That's a whole other lesson there, but you know, the only way to joy is through gratitude. That's why God wants us to be grateful. Imagine how good God is. He's made all these marvelous things that we can actually enjoy and give thanks for, and in giving thanks for Him, we receive even more blessings. It, it, it takes a sinful human being to take that idea and twist it all out of shape, where you can't eat this food, and you can't do that. And, you know. We can know for sure what is acceptable to him or not from his word. Food, for example, in Mark 7, uh, Gospel of Mark 7, 18 to 23, and in Colossians 2, 16 to 23, these two writers, they tell us food cannot make us more or less pleasing to God, and those who say so are false teachers. You know, if you can control what a person eats, and if you can control, you know, a third party can control their sex life, you pretty much control that person. Marriage, which was an issue, 
1 Corinthians 9, 3 to 5, 1 Timothy 3 and 2, Hebrews 13, 4, those are just references. If the apostles were married, then everybody can be married. The only restriction is in marriage is fidelity to your partner. The reason people were led away on these issues is that they didn't rely on God's word. If God permits and blesses and sanctifies, then man can receive it all happily. A third thing that Paul tells, and don't forget, we're always staying within the same context of you know, the idea here. Prayer purifies. We live in a sinful world. We ourselves are sinners and imperfect, even though we are forgiven. What enables us to use and eat the things of this world and live with our spouses, even though we are both sinners, is the purifying power of prayer. Think about it for a second. In the chain of people and events that brings me my food from the farm to my plate, speaking of Bud's plate, he has a talking plate, I have a plate for eating. <laughs> so in the chain of people and events that brings me my food from the farm to my plate, who knows what kinds of injustices have been committed? Have you ever thought about that? Maybe the farmer is greedy or cruel to his workers. Perhaps the processor of my food is an adulterer. Perhaps the store where I bought the food is robbing its employees. Or the person who wrapped up my groceries is a blasphemer of God. And of course, I myself am a sinner needing grace and forgiveness each and every day. Think about it. If I knew all of these things to be true, how could I eat this food with a clear conscience? Paul says that your prayers of thanksgiving and blessing before God sanctifies, purifies your hands and your food so you can eat it with a grateful heart and a clear conscience. I mean, if it were not so, I would feel guilty every time my belly is full because I know that so many people in the world starve. I mean, if, if I didn't have this understanding from the word that my, my, my gratitude and my thanksgiving in prayer to God is what purifies the food that enables me to eat it with a clear conscience, I mean, I, 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 I have trouble sleeping at night. There are a lot of people going to bed hungry and I've got a fridge full of food. So before we go on to the next section, you know, in 1 Timothy, I, I want to say a word about extremes here. Many times we read this passage in 1 Timothy or the passage in Galatians 1, 6 to 9 you know, about false teachers and, and we assume that we can accuse anybody who disagrees with us on doctrine of being false teachers. You know, we need to understand that apostasy is a reference to those who were falling away from the gospel and its message, which Paul summarized in verse 16, chapter three. And what was the message? That Jesus, the divine Son of God, came in the flesh. That He resurrected from death, His death on the cross. And the gospel message is that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, expressed in repentance and baptism. And we also believe, the Bible teaches, that Jesus returned to heaven and promised to return once again and this time for judgment at the end of the world. I mean, in a nutshell, that's the gospel. False teaching was doctrine that attacked or tried to change or deny these basics, uh, basic ideas of the gospel message. So someone who believes it's okay to worship with an instrument may be mistaken biblically or require more teaching to become more mature but it would be an overstatement to call such a person a heretic. Okay. In the Bible, this accusation was reserved for those who taught things that undermined the gospel itself, which include the main points that I mentioned before. I, I'm not making this up. It's not me now, Mike Mazzalongo, you know, who is saying you know, this thing about instruments. 
No, no, this is what the New Testament teaches about heresy and who is a heretic? And who, who, who do you put that label on? You know, in the past, we, we've been kind of fast and loose by affixing that label on anybody who disagreed with us on anything at all. And that was unbiblical, because the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible is very, you know, very precise in demonstrating who is the heretic and what is considered, quote, a heresy. In the Bible, people were disciplined or excommunicated for three things. False teaching, and I put in brackets, false teaching of the gospel. In Galatians, he said, you know, if, if anybody teaches any other thing other than what I taught you, well, what was the thing that he taught them? Well, the gospel is what he taught them. People could be disciplined or disfellowship for divisiveness, causing trouble between members. Romans 16, 17 even tells us, you, know, you give them a warning and it's very specific. And also gross public immorality, unrepented public adultery, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. But somebody who disagrees or believes something different on issues that are not you know, pertinent to our salvation? You might not agree. Some people think, you know what? Mixed bathing, men and women swimming in the same swimming pool, or men and women being at the beach, they believe, well, you shouldn't do that. That's not, that's not right. You know, we, we need to separate the men and the women. Okay, fine, that's what you believe. But if somebody believes otherwise, that doesn't make that person a heretic. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that the Bible teaches two things about each subject. The Bible teaches something specific on all these topics. And hopefully we'll be mature enough to understand what it teaches on all these topics. And hopefully we grow and have wisdom so we know how to apply the Bible's teaching on all these topics. But we need to be careful who we accuse of being a heretic. I feel a little safer uh, following the Bible, the New Testament, especially guideline. Like if they call that person a false teacher for that reason, then I feel secure that I can call someone who is doing that the same thing. But I don't want to go past what the Bible is teaching. Someone who is just difficult, sometimes we just, <laughs> we call people, you know, false teachers or whatever, just because we don't get along with them or we don't like the way they teach or someone who's failed in marriage or struggling with sexual sins. These are not causes to accuse people of false teaching or disfellowshipping someone. These are matters of growth and spiritual maturity where we need to be patient with each other, open to listening and learning, able to put up with the weakness of others in order to maintain unity and forgiving those who struggle with marriage problems, knowing that we are not here to judge our brothers, but to love and help them know uh, 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 and do what is right, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Our response to immaturity is maturity. <laughs> That's how we respond to immaturity. And so after having dealt with the uh, you know, four exhortations and encouragement, uh, you know, having dealt with the apostasy, you know, the danger of apostasy, Paul gives four encouragements to Timothy as a minister. Remember, all of this business is taking place in the church at Ephesus, and Timothy is a young preacher trying to deal with this. And since Paul can't be there in person, he writes this letter to kind of give him some, something to work with, some instructions. So four encouragements to the young preacher. Number one, he points out what is true and what is false. He says, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished uh, on the words of the faith and of sound doctrine which you have been following. So let me kind of double back. What does he say to him? He says to him, part of your job is to point out what's true and what's not true to the brethren. Some Bibles say putting into remembrance, but the meaning is the same. Paul refers back to the teaching he has given in the previous verses and tells him to 
point these teachings out to the church and remind them of these things. He not only has to remind the church, he also must keep these things in mind and grow in his knowledge and assurance of these things as well. You know, think about the divinity of Christ and the resurrection and the message of the gospel. Today we'd say the best offense, excuse me, the best defense is offense. That's what he's telling him. You're, you're playing defense against these false teachers and the trouble in the church and so on and so forth. You need to play offense. You need to get out there and teach what is proper and point out what is false and so on and so forth. Okay. So Paul says to Timothy that the best way to protect himself and the church from false doctrine is to continually be absorbed in and teaching what is true. All right. Somebody, why, why, do we, why do we have a Wednesday class? It's cold and it's dark. Why, why have a Wednesday class? Because we, our, task, our task is to continually teach God's word to whoever will come and, and hear God's word. Number two, he says to him, the good minister practices and teaches personal spiritual discipline, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, for it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. So Timothy should avoid arguing and debating useless doctrines. You know what I said to you before? You know, uh, should you do everything your flesh wants, or should, or should you deny your flesh? He said, don't, don't get into debates uh, for things like that, uh, old wives' tales, genealogies, you know, don't, don't do that. A more productive activity is to discipline or train yourself for godliness. In other words, do those things and activities and disciplines that'll develop a godly character. Physical exercise is good, of course. Disciplining the body is important, but training the spirit is better because the body dies, but the spirit lives on. Preparing for heaven is better than preparing for life here on earth. This was another saying of Christians at that time, you know, in verse eight, as it is said, you know, it was a saying, okay? And Paul says it's a good saying because it points to an important truth. Timothy should practice and teach about spiritual discipline because it's this that's, uh, that serves best the Christian's ultimate hope and goal. And what is that? I want to be with God in heaven. I want to resurrect from the dead. That's what I want. So I do the things here on earth that nourish that hope. I do the things here on earth that prepare me for that. Like a good coach, Timothy should demonstrate the spiritual discipline that he wishes to impact to the church as he trains them in becoming like God and being with God. In other words, don't just do what I say, watch me, do what I do. Those who oppose him, perhaps the false teachers who may accuse him of you know, being too young, to be taken seriously in order to understand his, uh, or undermine his influence. He says these guys will be stopped, not by arguments and debates over foolish questions. He says they're going to be stopped and, and, and the entire congregation will be won over and influenced and impacted by the way that Timothy acts. For example, the way he speaks with wisdom and truth, the way he conducts himself, in maturity, the way he treats other people in love, the way he lives faithfully, in purity. Paul was talking about that Sunday for the communion. Examine our minds, are we living a pure life? Paul is saying the same thing here. Ministers are like everybody else. People are impressed more by what they do than what they say. The third exhortation, the third exhortation to the young minister. The good minister preaches the word. Verse 13, he says, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. 
or the elder is another word for that. For some reason or other, Timothy may have stopped or restricted his public preaching. Perhaps the pressure from the false teachers was making him doubt his ability, his effectiveness. You know, people who criticize you or second guess you may lead you to lose confidence in yourself and your abilities. In verse 14, Paul reminds him of the way he was called into ministry, prophetic utterance, and he was ordained into service by the church leadership, by the laying on of hands of the elders. He's, he's basically saying to him, hey man, you are a legitimate minister. No matter what the false teachers say, no matter, you're not getting the, re the reaction that you're wanting to get, you are a legitimate minister. Why? Because you were called to ministry and that call was confirmed by the leaders of the church and you were commis commissioned or commended into service through prayer and through the laying on of the hands of the elders. You are a minister. And as a true minister, you need to focus on your work. So what is his work? Well, read the word to the church. The Bible was not collected or distributed at this time. They only had the Old Testament and some letters of the apostles. So reading these to the church was a main way of familiarizing themselves with God's word. Today we have our Bibles on our phones, but in those days, yeah, nobody had that. And exhortation, encouragement to do or avoid doing certain things according to God's word, an appeal to act and think as God would have us act and think. They needed encouragement, the preachers and the church, to believe the truth and to practice spiritual discipline. And then the third thing, teaching. The plain teaching of the truth contained in the word. Instruction on the true gospel and the person of Christ. If you hear a lie often enough, it starts sounding true. He says, you need to beat back the lies and the false teaching by repeating and continually preaching and explaining the value of the gospel. Instruction on uh, church organization and leadership that Paul provided in his uh, first uh, uh, chapters of this book. There's a lot to learn about in the Christian faith and part of the preacher's job is to teach the church about the faith and the Lord and Christian living. Here's a young guy, he's being trained. Today we have colleges, we have preacher schools, we have all kinds of things where young men can go and be trained, missionaries, so on and so forth. But in the beginning, the, there were no such things. Preachers were trained in the church. The church was responsible for recruiting and training and sending into service preachers. And nothing has changed in 2,000 years. We still do that today. The only difference is we have more resources today than they had back then. We do have schools that specialize in training ministers. We do have universities that give uh, higher education and, and, and uh, training to those who want to teach or preach or be uh, scholars, you know, uh, linguists in Hebrew and Greek and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of resources, but you know what? The responsibility for raising up preachers and training them still belongs to the church. It doesn't belong to the schools. They're, they help, but the responsibility is ours. Note that Paul says, until I come. He plans to do uh, some exhorting and teaching himself when he comes. But he lets Timothy, you know, he, he tells Timothy not to abandon these things in the meantime. Don't just wait for me to show up, he says. You get busy and do your job until I get there. And then the fourth thing he talks about, the good minister perseveres in ministry. Preachers, ministers are ordinary men who have been called and trained to serve in God's church. Like ordinary people, they become tired and discouraged for a variety of reasons. For example, lack of response or success. The church members who do not grow spiritually refuse to mature or fall away from Christ or, at always, or they're always at the same point in their spiritual development. You know, ministries like gardening. If you uh, weed and feed and care for the garden but it doesn't produce any fruit, you become a little discouraged. It's the same thing in the church. Another discouragement, lack of encouragement. Unlike businesses where you get raises or promotions or perks in response to your efforts, ministers are rewarded when their members are growing in Christ. 
Some grow tired of serving without any feedback or reward from the congregation for their work. Ministers are discouraged by the abundance of criticism. Timothy was beginning to feel the effects of opposition and criticism. He was not preaching or teaching like he should have been. He was gun shy. A steady diet of criticism and complaining without any encouragement or reward often drives ministers to quit and do something else that is less stressful. So sensing that Timothy was feeling tired and discouraged, Paul gives him an exhortation to persevere in his ministry. Don't quit, don't give up. In verse 15 he says, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Take pains means to focus on or to be absorbed by the things that Paul has just spoken of. And what is that? Well, pointing out true and false doctrine, practicing spiritual discipline, preaching the words, and be busy in those things. The idea is that Timothy, although a young man, had been with Paul for a long time. He was not a novice, he was a true minister. As he focused on his ministry, the church would recognize his maturity and the fact that Paul's trust in him to lead the church was well-founded. Those who thought that he was too young would have a different opinion when they saw him absorbed in his ministry. Verse 16, he says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So pay attention, he says, to what you're doing and what's being taught and what you have been taught yourself, the true gospel. He was taught the true gospel by a true apostle, something that these false teachers could not say. If he perseveres, if he continues, he will ensure or guarantee that he will maintain his own salvation by believing and teaching the true gospel and living by it. In addition to this, He'll do the same for those who listen to him uh, and, his, uh, and his teaching. And so uh, in the end, Paul tells all ministers actually, not just Timothy, he tells them to preach the gospel to the lost so that they will be saved. I think that's what we do here. We have, we have lots of people that do that. Our members share their faith with other people. We also do it in an organized way. We, supp we, uh, we support missionaries in other countries to bring the gospel to people who might not hear it otherwise. Uh, we also do it through our Bible talk ministry online. Thousands and thousands of people. There are only a few here listening to this in this classroom, but uh, the, the number of people that will eventually hear this lesson will be in the thousands in, in, in not a very long time. So it's our way to promote the gospel. Okay. He also tells them he should teach God's word to the church so that the saved will mature in Christ and that they persevere in their ministry as an example so that all will remain faithful until the Lord comes either in death or in glory. All right, so we're going to stop right here. It's a good time to stop. Next lesson, we're going to start a long section with specific teaching on various issues and questions that concerned the church at that time. They had special questions they asked and Paul will deal with them. All right, so I thank you for your attention, we're good.